Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, normally, when I walk up to the podium, it is to talk about fraud and cybercrime and counterfeiting and identity theft and things of that nature. But the school has asked me today if I would just come and talk a little bit about uh, my life. As you know, I've had many people tell my story in books, movies, television, Broadway musicals. And of course, those very creative people have enjoyed telling my story from their point of view. So I thought that um, I thought this morning I would just actually tell you the story from my point of view. I was raised just north of New York City in Westchester County, New York, in a little town called Bronxville. I was actually one of four children in the family, the so-called middle child of the four. I was educated there by the Christian Brothers of Ireland at a private Catholic school called Iona in New Rochelle, New York, where I went to school from kindergarten to high school. By the time I had reached the age of 16 in the 10th grade, my parents, after 22 years of marriage one day, decided to get a divorce. Unlike most divorces, where the children were usually the first to know, my parents were very good about keeping that a secret. I remember being in the 10th grade when the father walked in the classroom and asked a brother to excuse me to class. When I came out in the hallway, the father handed me my books and told me that one of the brothers would drive me to the county seat in White Plains, New York, where I would meet my parents and they would explain what was going on. I remember the brothers dropped me at the steps of a big stone building and told me to go on up the steps and that my parents would be waiting for me in the lobby. As I climbed the steps, I noticed a sign on the building that said family court, but I really didn't understand what that meant. When I arrived in the lobby, my parents were not there, but I was ushered into the back of an immense courtroom where my parents were standing before a judge. I couldn't hear what the judge was saying, nor my parents' response, but eventually the judge asked me to approach the bench, so I walked up to stand in between my parents. I remember distinctly that the judge never looked at me. He never acknowledged I was standing there. He just simply read from his papers and said that my parents were getting a divorce. Because I was 16 years old, I would need to tell the court which parent I chose to live with. I started to cry, so I turned and ran out of the courtroom. The judge called for a 10 minute recess, but by the time my parents got outside, I was gone. My mother never saw me again for about seven years until I was a young adult. Contrary to the movie, my father never saw me or ever spoke to me again. In the mid-1960s, running away was a very popular thing for young people. A lot of them got caught up in Haight-Ashbury, the hip scene, the drug scene. Instead, I took a few belongings from my home, packed them in a bag, and boarded what was then the New Haven and Hartford Railroad for the short train ride down to Grand Central Terminal in New York. My father did own a stationery store, but in Manhattan, located on the corner of 40th and Madison. Like all of us, we had to work in the store, so I made deliveries for my dad from the time I was about 13. I knew the city very well, so naturally I started looking for the same type of work. There were a lot of signs on the window, stock boy, delivery boy, part-time. I'd walk in and apply. So tell me, young man, how old are you? Uh, 16. How far did you go in high school? 10th grade. I'll hire you. And I went to work for a small amount of money, a few hours a day, but I soon realized I couldn't support myself on that amount of money. I also realized that as long as people believed I was 16 years old, they weren't going to pay me any more money. At 16, I was six foot tall. I've always had a little gray hair. My friends in school used to say that once a week when we dress for mass in a suit, I look more like a teacher than a student. So I decided to lie about my age. In New York, we had a driver's license at 16. Back then, they didn't have a photo on it, just an IBM card. So I altered one digit of my date of birth. I was actually born in April of 1948, but I dropped the four, converted it to a three, and that made me 10 years older, or 26 years old. I started around looking for the same type of work. People did give me a little more money, a few more hours, but even then it was very difficult to make ends meet. One of the few things I had taken when I left home was a checkbook. My father had opened a checking account for me at a small community bank in Mount Vernon, New York. I had a little money in that account, so every so often I would write a check to supplement my income. $20, $25, funds were there, checks were good. But it was my friends, my peers, who would constantly say to me, you know, you're the only guy I know, walks into a bank in the middle of Manhattan. You have no account there. You don't know a soul. You talk to somebody behind a desk and they okay your check. Uh, well, my checks are good. Uh, I walked in that bank, they wouldn't touch my check. You walk in, they don't bat an eye. Years later, reporters would write and speculate and say that that was my upbringing, mannerisms, dress, appearance, speech, whatever it was, it was very easy to do. So consequently, when the money ran out, 
I kept writing those checks. <laughs> of course, the checks started to bounce. Police started looking for me as a runaway, so I thought maybe it was a good time to start thinking about leaving New York City. But I was quite apprehensive about going to Chicago, Miami, wondered if they'd cash a New York check on a New York driver's license in Miami as quickly as they did in Manhattan. I was walking up 42nd Street one afternoon about 5 o'clock in the evening, 16 years old, pondering all of these things when I started to approach the front door of an old hotel that used to be there called the Commodore Hotel, now the Grand Hyatt. Just as I was about to get to the front door of the hotel, out stepped an Eastern Airline flight crew onto the sidewalk. I couldn't help but notice the captain, the co-pilot, the flight engineer, about three or four flight attendants dragging their bags to the curb to load them in a van to take them to the airport. As they loaded the van, I thought to myself, that's it. If I could pose as a pilot, I could travel all over the world for free. I probably could get just about anybody anywhere to cash a check for me. So I walked up the street a little further to 42nd and Park. I went to cross over, but I heard a huge helicopter. So I looked up and there was New York Airways landing on the roof of the Pan Am building. Pan Am, the nation's flag carrier, the airline that flew around the world. I thought, what a perfect airline to use. So the next day, I placed a phone call to the executive corporate offices of Pan Am. When the switchboard was ringing, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to say. When they answered, Pan American Airlines, good morning, could I help you? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'd, like um, I'd like to speak to somebody in the um, purchasing department. Purchasing? One moment. And the clerk came on and said, yes, sir, maybe you can help me. My name is uh, John Black. I'm a co-pilot with the company based out of San Francisco. Been with the company about seven years. Never had anything like this come up before. Oh, what's the problem? Well, we flew a trip in here yesterday. Oh, we're going out today. Yesterday, I sent my uniform out through the hotel to have it dry clean. Now the hotel and the cleaner say they can't find it. Here I am with a flight in about four hours, new uniform. Don't you have a spare uniform? Certainly, back home in San Francisco, but I never get it here in time for my flight. Do you understand that this would cost you the price of a uniform, not the company? I understand. Well, hold on, I'll be right back. And he came back and said, my supervisor says you need to go down to the well-built uniform company on Fifth Avenue. They're our supplier. I'll call them and let them know you're on the way. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to know, so I went down to the well-built uniform company. <laughs> Little fellow, Mr. Rosen, fitted me out in the uniform. Back then, they were black Aberdeen, the three gold stripes on the arm, the gray hair. I certainly looked old enough to be the pilot. When it was all done, I said, how much do I owe you? Well, the uniform's $286. I said, no problem, I'll write you a check. <laughs> no, we can't take any checks. Oh, well then, um, I'll just pay cash. No, we can't accept cash. You need to fill out this computer card. Then in these boxes, put your employee number. And we bill this back under uniform allowance. Comes out of your next Pan Am paycheck. Oh, that's even better. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> New York had two airports, LaGuardia and Kennedy. LaGuardia was 20 minutes from Manhattan. Kennedy was 50, so naturally LaGuardia being the closer of the two, that's where I went. I spent most of the morning walking around LaGuardia in the uniform, trying to figure out, now that I had this uniform, how the hell did you get on these planes? <laughs> well, I got a little hungry about lunchtime, so I walked in the luncheonette, sat down at the counter on the stool, and ordered a sandwich. Moments later, a TWA crew walked in. Flight attendants sat in the booth, pilots up at the counter on either side of me, captain right next to me. Now, back before deregulation of the airlines, airline people thought of themselves as just one big family. They didn't hesitate a moment to talk to each other, and the captain kind of leaned over. Hey, young man, how's Pan Am doing? Doing just fine, Captain. Tell me, what's Pan Am doing out here at LaGuardia? Pan Am doesn't fly into LaGuardia, they only fly into Kennedy. <laughs> well, I picked up on that right away. <laughs> yeah, we came into Kennedy, but I had a short layover, and I came over to visit some friends of mine. Matter of fact, I'm on my way back to Kennedy now. So tell me, young man, uh, what type of equipment are you on? Now, airline people have a lot of jargon for things, and one of them is they never call a plane a plane or an aircraft, they call it equipment, and what type of equipment you're on meant what type of plane do you fly back then, the DCA, the 707. Of course, I didn't know that, and I thought, what type of equipment am I on? The equipment I'm on is this stool. <laughs> they must mean what type of equipment is on the planes I fly. So I thought, well, they've got the wing, they've got the engine. 
They always had a sticker on the engine, who manufactured the engine. So I said, yes, yeah, General Electric. All three pilots kind of just stopped eating and leaned over. Captain said, oh, really? What do you fly, washing machines? So I knew I said the wrong thing out the door I went. Everybody had an airline ID card, a plastic laminated card, much like a driver's license today, yet without the ID card, the uniform was worthless. I went back to Manhattan pretty discouraged, thinking where would I come up with the Pan American Airline corporate ID. I was sitting in the hotel room, I noticed a big thick Manhattan yellow pages on the dresser, so I pulled them down on the bed, flipped them open, looked under the word identification. There were two or three pages of companies who made convention badges, metal badges, plastic badges, police badges, fire badges, started to call around and finally one company said, listen, most of those airline IDs manufactured by Polaroid, 3M company, need to call one of them. Finally got the 3M company on the phone in Manhattan. Yes, we manufacture Pan Am's identification system, along with a number of other carriers. How come? Tell you I'm a purchasing officer for a major U.S. carrier. I'm in New York just for the day. We're getting ready to expand our routes, hire a lot of new employees, go to a formal ID. We're very impressed with this Pan Am format. Wondered if I came by your office this afternoon briefly, we could discuss quantity and price. By all means, come on by. So I went by dressed in the suit and the sales rep opened the book. Yeah, we do Braniff, National, Eastern, Delta, Pan Am, Pan Am. We like this Pan Am format. Think you'd have a sample I could bring back? Sure, I'll be right back. And he brought me back actually a five by seven glossy piece of paper with a picture of an ID card blown up in the middle of it. Someone else's picture in the picture. John Doe for a name. And in bold red ink across the front, this is a sample only. I said, no, I'm afraid this one, do you know? I need to bring back an actual physical card. And by the way, what is all this equipment on the floor? Oh, no, we don't just sell this card. We sell this system, camera, laminator. So we have to buy all this, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, since we have to buy it all, why don't you just demonstrate how it works and use me? Fine, have a seat right here. <laughs> Took my picture, made up the card. And... I was going down the elevator studying the card. It had a blue border across the top, about a quarter of an inch in Pan Am's color blue, but not a single thing on the card said Pan Am. No logo, no insignia, no company name. This was a plastic card, like a credit card. You couldn't type on it, you couldn't write on it, you couldn't print on it. Discouraged, I put it in my pocket headed back to the hotel. As I was walking back, I noticed that I had passed a hobby shop, so I turned around and walked back. Excuse me, sir, I see you sell a lot of models here. You sell models of commercial jetliners? Sure, right over there. And I bought a model of a Pan Am 707 cargo jet for about $2.40, took it back to my room, opened the box, threw all the parts out, but there on the bottom of the box was a sheet of decals that went on the model. And the little Pan Am blue globe that would have went on the tail of the plastic plane went perfect up at the top of the plastic card. And the word Pan Am and their special styling of graphics that would have went on the fuselage went perfect across the top of the card. And the clear decal on the laminated plastic made a beautiful identification card. Pan Am says they estimate that between the ages of 16 and 18 years old, I flew on more than a million miles for free boarding more than 260 commercial aircraft in 26 countries around the world. Pan Am says, keep in mind that though Frank Abagnale did in fact pose as one of our pilots, he never once stepped on board one of our aircraft. That's true. I never flew on Pan Am because I was afraid that someone might say to me, you know, I'm based in San Francisco, been out there 16 years, don't recall ever meeting you before. Or someone might say, you know, your ID card is not exactly like my ID card. So instead, I flew on everyone else. If I wanted to go somewhere, I literally just walked out to the airport and looked up on the board, United Flight 800 to Chicago. Then I went downstairs to the door marked United Operations and walked in. The operations clerk, hey Pan Am, what can we do for you? I was wondering if the jump seats open on 800 to Chicago. I like the deadhead Chicago this evening. It's open this evening, I'd like to get a pink slip pass. I'd give him my ID, he'd write me out a pass, I'd walk out, hand it to the flight attendant, she'd open the door to the cockpit and I'd step in. They had a captain, a co-pilot, a flight engineer, and a seat behind the captain called the jump seat, where pilots deadhead on company time. Now, because pilots love to talk shop, once you picked up that jargon, it was the same conversation over and over and over. <laughs> so I just step on board, even Jim, Bob Davis, be arriving in Chicago. On the taxi out, always the same question. So Bob, how long you been with Pan Am? Been flying about seven years. What position you fly? A right seat, which is airline terminology for a co-pilot. What type of equipment are you on? Had that one down, perfect. <laughs> Matter of fact, whatever they flew, I didn't fly, so I had no problems with that. 
Then we'd arrive in Chicago, I'd go by the Pan Am ticket counter, but just enough to get the attention of the passenger service rep. Yes, I could help you? Excuse me, where do we lay over here? At the dead at a trip where somebody got ill, never laid over in Chicago. So we used the Parma House Hilton downtown, catch a crew bus, low level door three out. I'd go down to the Parma House Hilton, walk in, and on the corner of the registration desk was a little sign that said airline cruise. That was a three ring binder you signed in, referenced your flight number, showed your ID, they'd give me a key, I'd stay two or three days, and Pan Am would be direct billed for my room and my meals. <laughs> I also could cash a personal check at the front desk because I was an employee of the airline. The airline had a contract with the hotel and they'd cash your check. But then I found out that every airline honors every other airline employee's personal check, a reciprocal agreement still practiced today in 2016. So a Delta flight attendant at the Syracuse airport can walk over to the American ticket counter, show her Delta ID, and they'll cash a personal check up to $100 and vice versa. Of course, when I found that out, I'd go out to JFK or LAX, only I'd go to everybody, Northeast, National, KLM, Air France. It would take me a good eight hours, stopping at every counter in every building. By the time I got around the other end of the airport, at least eight hours had gone by, and what do you have in eight hours? Shift change, new people, so I'd go all the way back around the other way. Of course, as many of you know, I went on to impersonate a doctor in a Georgia hospital for a while. I took the bar in the state of Louisiana, passed the bar, went to work for the attorney general of the state in the civil court where I spent about a year. No one the wiser in either case, I resigned on my own and left. Of course, like any criminal, sooner or later you get caught, and I was no exception to that rule. I was arrested just once in my life, at the age of 21, by the French police in a small town in southern France called Montpellier. The French police actually arresting me on an Interpol warrant from the Swedish police who were looking for me for forgery in Sweden but believed that I was residing in France. When the French authorities took me into custody on the Swedish warrant, they realized I'd forged checks all over France, so they refused to honor the warrant and my request for extradition. They later convicted me of forgery and sent me to French prison. I served my time in a place called the Maison d'Array, the house of arrest in a small town in southern France called Pepignan. Steven Spielberg told Barbara Walters, it was extremely important to me to go back to that prison, to the exact cell he was in, and reconstruct it according to the logbooks during his stay there, which he said was a blanket on the floor, no mattress, a hole in the floor to go to the bathroom, no plumbing, no electricity. He said, according to the logbooks, I entered the prison at 198 pounds, left the prison at 109 pounds. When my sentence was over, I was extradited to Sweden, where I was later convicted of forgery in a Swedish court of law and sent to a Swedish penitentiary in Malmo, Sweden. When my prison term was up in Sweden, US federal authorities took custody of me and returned me to the United States. Eventually, a United States federal judge would sentence me to 12 years in federal prison. I served four of those 12 years at a federal prison in Petersburg, Virginia. When I was 26 years old, the government offered to take me out of prison on the condition I go to work for an agency of the federal government for the remainder of my sentence or until my parole had expired. I agreed and was released. This year I'm celebrating 40 years with the FBI. I have been there for four decades. I work out of Washington, D.C., but I make my home in Charleston, South Carolina, so I commute up by plane on Monday mornings and back on Thursday afternoon. I live in Charleston with my one and only wife of 39 years and my three sons. My youngest boy graduated from the University of Beijing in China. He went on to get his master's degree there. He reads, writes, and speaks Chinese fluently. He works for an American company in San Francisco. My middle son graduated from University of Nevada in Las Vegas. His degree was in hotel management. He and his wife own a business in South Carolina, and he manages that business. My oldest boy, 36, graduated from University of Kansas at KU, went on to Loyola School of Law in Chicago to get his law degree and passed the bar in Illinois went on to make his dad very, very proud. He's an FBI agent in our Baltimore field office. He's celebrating 11 years in the FBI. He's our supervisory agent over the espionage squad that we operate out of the Baltimore uh, field office. As many of you know, I had very little to do with the film. I would have preferred not to have a movie made about my life. I raised my three boys in Tulsa, Oklahoma for 25 years and commuted to Washington, D.C. just to keep them away from just that. In the end, I was very pleased that Steven Spielberg decided to make the movie. As he said, I did not immortalize Frank Abagnale on film because what he did some 40 years ago as a teenage boy, I immortalized him on film because of what he's done for his country, 
for close to 40 years. In the end, my family and I were very pleased with the outcome of the film. I assumed that the film would run and, and after a couple of years the film would be forgotten. I never dreamed that Catch Me If You Can would go on to earn more than a billion dollars for DreamWorks and be shown over and over around the world and then become a popular Broadway musical and then a kind of popular television show, White Collar, on TV. Because of that, I get a lot of emails back in Washington. I can go to work on Monday mornings and know that that TV movie, uh, the movie has been played on TV somewhere in the world just by the emails that I receive, whether they be in Russian, Chinese, or American. Uh, they come from people as young as eight years old to people as old as 80 who feel compelled to send the email. They have no idea whether I'll ever see them or read them. They just feel they have a statement to make, and they write. Some write and say, you know, you were brilliant. You were an absolute genius. I was neither. I was just a child. Had it been brilliant, had it been a genius, I don't know that I would have found it necessary to break the law in order to just simply survive. And while I know that there are people fascinated by what I did some 50 years ago as a teenage boy, I've always looked upon what I did as something that was immoral, illegal, unethical, and a burden I live with every day of my life and will until my death. There are many who write and say, well, you know, you were certainly gifted that I was. I was one of those few children who got to grow up in the world with a daddy. Now, the world is full of fathers, but there are very few men worthy of being called daddy by their child. I had a daddy who loved his children more than he loved life itself. Steven Spielberg would rather write that the more I researched Frank's youth without ever having met Frank, I couldn't help but put his father in the film through the likes of Christopher Walken. My father was a man who had four children, three boys and a daughter. Every night at bedtime, he'd walk into your room. He was 6'3". He would drop down on one knee, kiss you on the cheek, pull the cover up, and he'd put his lip right upon your earlobe and he'd whisper deep into your, I love you, I love you very much. He never, ever, Mr. Knight. As I grew older, I sometimes fell asleep before he got home, but I always woke up in the next morning and knew he had been by my bedside. Years later, my older brother joined me in my room. He was 6'4", in the Marine Corps, played semi-pro football for Buffalo, but my father would walk around to his bed, hug him, kiss him, whisper in his ear he loved him. When I was 16 years old, I was just a child. All 16-year-olds are just children. Much as we like them to be adults, they're just children. And like all children, they need their mother and they need their father. All children need their mother and their father. All children are entitled to their mother and their father. And though it is not popular to say so, divorce is a very devastating thing for a child to deal with and then have to deal with the rest of their natural life. For me, a complete stranger said I had to choose one parent over the other. That was a choice I could not make, so I ran. How could I tell you my life was glamorous? I cried myself to sleep till I was 19 years old. I spent every birthday, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day in a hotel room somewhere in the world by myself. The only people that associated with me were people who believed, me to be, believed that I was their peer, 10 years older than I actually was. I never got to go to a senior prom, high school football game, share a relationship with someone my own age. I always knew I'd get caught. It was just a matter of time. The law sometimes sleeps, but the law never dies. I was caught. I went to some very bad places. My boys have grown up asking your mother, why is it that dad wakes up in the middle of the night? Because you know he goes down the TV room. He doesn't turn the TV on. He just sits there all night because there are things you can't forget, things you're not meant to forget. While I was sitting in that pitch black cell in France, my father, 57, was climbing the subway stairs in New York as he did every day. He was in great physical shape. He just happened to trip. He reached his arm out to break his fall. He slipped, hit his head on a railing, landed at the bottom of the step. He was dead. I didn't know he was dead. I was sitting in that cell thinking about him, how much I couldn't wait to see him hold him, hug him, kiss him, tell him how sorry I was, but I never got the opportunity to do that. I was very fortunate because I was brought up in a great country where everyone gets a second chance. 
I owe my country 800 times more than I could ever repay it for the opportunities it's given me these past 40 years. That is why I'm at the FBI today, 32 years after a federal court order has expired for me to do so. I have turned down three pardons from three sitting presidents of the United States because I do not believe, nor will I ever believe, that a piece of paper will excuse my actions, that only in the end my actions will. 39 years ago, on an undercover assignment in Houston, Texas, I met my wife. When my assignment was over, I broke protocol to tell her who I really was. I didn't have a dime to my name, but I eventually asked her to marry me against the wishes of her parents. She did. And I could sit here and tell you I was born again, I saw the light, a prison rehabilitated me, but the truth is, God gave me a wife, she gave me three beautiful children, she gave me a family, and she changed my life. She and she alone. Everything I have, everything I've achieved, who I am today is because of the love of a woman and the respect three boys have for their father, something I would never, ever jeopardize. There comes a time in all of our lifetimes that we grow older and we have children. And as every parent in this room knows, whether your child is three months old or 36 years old, when you lay your head on a pillow at night, no matter where that pillow is, and you are just about to close your eyes, the last thing you think about, the last thing you worry about, are your children. So if you still have your mother, you still have your father, you give him a hug, you give him a kiss, you tell him you love them while you can. And to those men in the audience, both young and old, I remind you what it is to truly, actually be a man. It has nothing to do with money, achievements, skills, accomplishments, degrees, professions, positions. A real man loves his wife. A real man is faithful to his wife. And a real man next to God and his country put his wife and his children as the most important thing in his life. Steven Spielberg made a wonderful film, but I've done nothing greater, nothing more rewarding, nothing more worthwhile, nothing that's brought me more peace, more joy, more happiness, more content in my life than simply being a good husband, a good father, and what I strive to be every day of my life, a great daddy. Pleasure being here with you this morning. God bless you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you.